Patrick. Hey, Michael J. Where do you want to start, man? Companions, modifications, existing standard decks. There's a lot of stuff. It's companions. Dude, companions have shook magic to its core. Uh, And dude, a lot of people are scared. I I mean, this isn't here or there or anything, but there. I think the Pioneer PTQ, because we'll probably talk about Sander today. Pioneer PTQ, I think, was won by a burn deck that had Luris in the sideboard with no interactions. It was just there. (laughs) <laughs> like just an eighth card, and I was well, just dude, like, "What does this card do? Nothing. It makes it you swings for battle three. Field forge." <laughs> but anyway, in standard, these companions have been doing some damage. Uh, I think, arguably, the most important archetype uh, to be affected by companions is Black Red Sacrifice, which doesn't even know which companion it wants, uh, and that's beside the the. You know the octopus that uh, has spawned an entire new archetype. I don't know. Where, where yeah, do you start? I, so this, I, well, I think this Rakdos deck is just not only is it one of the like it's the deck to be coming out the gate. It's also, I think, uh, it's going to remain a pillar of the format. And I think you hit the nail on the head that it's an unresolved issue which companion to play. Because there are at least four legit options, and a couple of which have already put up big finishes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, do you want to talk about the Obosh version or the Luris version, or, or I mean, well, yeah, let's which start Luris version, right? So, yeah. So, yeah. Well, starting with, uh, yeah, I guess to me, Luris is kind of the default one to start with, just because of how much it's kind of it's arguably the best of the companions on rate. Yeah. And uh, it's already been extremely successful in every single format online. Like yeah. It's won super PTQs in both Modern and Pioneer already, right, in burn decks. And uh, that's not – I mean, I think it'll probably be even more powerful in Standard because of the Realms of Card Power. So uh, it so it took uh, – it took the top sl- – so it – Basically, companions were dominating vintage, legacy, pioneer, modern, and standard, and draft for that matter. Oh, but like draft, is, I mean, whoa, draft. People are are all talking about ridiculous. Just you see a companion, you take it and draft right now, right? That's the. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, whatever you got to do. You, I mean, eighty. You know, eighty. Like, I guess if you got to play sixty cards, play sixty cards. Whatever you got to do. <laughs> so if you got to ditch your removal, extra. if you got to ditch your removal, move it. Okay, ditch your removal. It's like, what do you got to do? Do you got to play with 20, 20 land just because you just don't have enough evens? <laughs> Fine, whatever you got to do. So yeah, first and second in the vintage challenge, first, second, third, and fourth in the legacy challenge. All eight of the slots at the modern challenge. One, two, three, four at the Pioneer Challenge, and six out of eight slots of the Standard Challenge for so, Companions, and Luris representing the, the the biggest one by far. So let's talk about Broken Pots underscore CB, first place in the Standard Challenge on, I want to say, the 20th of April on 420, and this is... No, a, this is the 19th. This is the 19th. Uh, yeah. The, anyway, the challenge was on the 19th. I think they posted the results the next oh, the day. It doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter. But the one that was played by Broken Pots underscore CB, this one is a relatively even port from previous format to current format. Uh, just not just adding Luris, right? Which is an which is a, a an important addition to the sideboard, but a ton of new cards to the main deck from the new set, right? Whisperer Squad, Serrated Scorpion, Call of the oh. Death Dweller. So actually, that kind of speaks to the important deviation of this one compared to the existing archetype and compared to other, uh, I guess, other possible companions. It's it's not just took a few cards out, put a few cards in. Uh, the removal of Woebringer and uh, the removal of Midnight Reaper, not playing with any threes or higher, that brings along with it... Uh, different challenges and rather than just playing you know expels that cost three or more we see ones this is a deck that can come out the gate much faster but unlike a lot of possible one drops you could play 
this deck actually has a lot of virtual threes. Uh, Whisper Squad is actually uh, such a great three drop. And it's such a great way to make sure that you're using your mana efficiently uh, later in the game, despite how low the, your curve is. What's more, it obviously synergizes fantastic with things like Priest of the Forgotten Gods, Witches Oven, so all that stuff. Let's talk about Whisper Squad for a second. So this card is B for a 1-1 one, one human soldier. And it has the additional text, 1 and a B, search your library for a card named Whisper Squad, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. This card is like, I mean, minus flying. This is just like really, really good squadron hawkish level card here, right? Yeah, I mean, it's got some key, despite how much it, ha- like it has some very powerful similarities, but costing one less is huge. And not having flying totally changes the context. You see, Whisper Squad is not a one-card army the way that Squadron Hawk is. Well, it's it is, just it not takes ha- a little time, right? Well, even if it gets going, though, it's not going to get through. That's not its job. Squadron Hawk could wear equipment and keep the attacks going. It could pressure Planeswalkers or defend your own. Here, Whisper Squad is not at risk of getting through. Too many people just have uh, like anything that can outclass it. Everybody has creatures because of companions. Whisper Squad here uh, gives you a ton of sacrifice fodder. And uh, it's, it's, it's super synergistic, and it's just a very efficient card. So here's the thing about Whisper Squad. You can play it on turn one because it costs one. You can just do nothing on turn two, right, and activate the Whisper Squad's ability if you have one from turn one to turn two. And that puts it directly into play, right? So that's that's very powerful. It doesn't just put it into your hand, right? And like you said, it's a it's a good three drop, right? So kind of two cards for three mana straight on turn three, what that could be gumming up the battlefield or could be priest forgotten uh, god's fodder. Like you said, that's not a bad deal on three. So here's another little move. You can activate this ability at instant speed. Like even though it puts the the block, you know the the creature on the battlefield tapped, so you can't surprise block with it or anything. When you ship the turn to your opponent, like, let's say you have one Whisper Squad in hand and one on the battlefield, you don't have to commit the other two Whisper Squads from your deck. You can wait to see if your opponent sweeps the board or not. Normally with Squadron Hawk, you just play out three of the Hawks or whatever they'd sweep the board, and you'd have one left over, right? But here, you can actually just commit one Whisper Squad to the table, leave your mana open, and then go get two more on the end step and ensure that you get a big hit unless they kill the one Whisper Squad, and then you just drop the other one and keep going. Sure. Uh, That's actually a great point. If you've got, like, you know, a ton of mana in play and you top deck a Whisper Squad, you just play it, you can... I don't know, leave up mana for your Castle Lothwain or whatever you want to do, depending on, on what your battlefield position is. But you could have an army if you're in top deck mode at the end of turn, right? The end of your opponent's turn. Totally. That's uh, good for a certain sideboard card that I am very happy to see in this strategy. <laughs> Finally! Uh, the Shield Breaker? No. A robber no, of no, the Rich? No. no. Not for Rika's Libations. No. What about... Act of treason. <laughs> no. Oh, it can't be the Myers grasp, could it? Oh, never mind. No, the reason I say is because to me, Myers grasp is that's a main deck card. And Broken Pots actually has one in the main deck as well. And part of that is that Myers grasp is just so beautiful with uh, with Luris. You yeah, know? so good with Luris. So. One of the other new cards in this deck, which I think is probably one of the most hilarious combos, and I think this is like how, you know, the Pioneer deck, that one with Luris, kind of did the same thing, is just Serrated Scorpion, right? You just play Serrated Scorpion, which is a 1-2 for B, and it has the text, when Serrated Scorpion dies, it deals 2 damage to each opponent, and you gain 2 life. Like, you just send this Serrated Scorpion, it deals 1, or they block it and kill it, and it deals 2, and you could just replay it with Luris, um, or it's amazing fodder uh, with Priest of Forgotten Gods. And I think, like, 
the pioneer verse is really like i guess i'm just trucking with my viachino pyromancer because that deck literally did nothing else with luris and it took away the you know the super i think they're calling it a, a super qualification now um but it's it's nutty what do you think about the serrated scorpion in this deck Love it. Love it in this deck. And I also, uh, I like the card in both Pioneer and Modern. I think Serrated Scorpion is the real deal, and it's time for burn decks to come around to black. Part of that is the Serrated Scorpion, which is just, as far as Lava Spikes go, I mean, this guy is the best Kelda Marauder ever. He's like, bad. The, oh my god, no. Yeah, like, it's 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 like... <sighs> Particularly in formats where it's not just getting beat on the merits by creatures on the ground. Like, and that's part of the reason why I like it in Modern and uh, and Pioneer is that it can just be adding up. It's very hard for, so, like, if you play a, a Scorpion right out the gate, you're going to get at least three, uh, three damage out of it. And very frequently, when the game stretches, you're still going to get... Uh, at the worst case scenario, a couple points of damage and the fact that it makes Luris so much better and stacks with Croxa, Titan of Death's Hunger, who is also a Mondo combo with Luris. Oh, wow. Croxa is not just a Mondo combo with Luris, which it is. It, that's insane, right? So if you've got Luris, you can play Croxa on the cheap. And then you can kind of machine gun Croxa, right? Because you're not actually forced to do all the stuff that Croxa makes you do to come out of the graveyard uh, by his lonesome. Isn't it also a pretty good combination with Call of the Death Dweller, which is one of the one of the new cards in this strategy? Uh, not only is it a good combination with Call of the Death Dweller, it's a good combination with Whisper Squad. Because Whisper Squad gives you lots of actual pieces of material, unlike most token makers which you can use to exile to play Croxa, even if you don't have any of the combos. So, but this, oh, go ahead. This deck's got a ton of one drops between Whisper Squad, Serrated Scorpion, Cauldron Familiar, and then it's got like a hasty two in Dreadhorde Butcher as well as Sideboard Robber of the Rich. But it seems to me that despite low casting costs and like you know an eight pack of haste attackers on two. This is kind of still like a kind of a positional grindy mid rangey deck. Is that is that a wrong well, read? It's got it. Well, I wouldn't. It's I don't think it's a mid range deck, but it has got a lot of grind and a lot of staying power. As far as uh, fast aggressive decks go, it's not actually as fast and aggressive as you would as you would think a deck with twenty one drops would be. But it uh, it's it's kind of like this perpetual slugging of you it just keeps damaging you and it all adds up and it's extremely resilient uh its biggest weaknesses in my in my opinion are people who go over the top of it oh yeah whether okay same weaknesses previous format right like you can have all the chip shot plus one interactions in the world if they're just doing, you know, one point of damage or getting you like one card that is basically a, a one, two for one or whatever, they're not going to add up to somebody who's slamming free dream trawlers or something like that, which some of the other decks are doing. Well, plus, I mean, Cauldron Familiar, uh, Cauldron Familiar with Witch's Oven, obviously that's a known issue, right? A known a source of uh, card advantage, grinding, and just general advantage over the course of the game. But also Dread Horde, Horde Butcher is potentially a two-for-one. Croxa is frequently a two-for-one. Priest of the Forgotten Gods can be a card advantage. Rick's Mahdi Reveler, a lot of grind, a lot of possibilities of being a two-for-one. Uh, Whisper I, Squad. I love it's Rick's Mahdi Reveler. I just realized on the cuts, there's no – the three the three casting cost Gnarled Mask guy that tings you for every sack, is he gone? Well, yeah, you can't play that because of Luris. Oh, wow. That's the key. You lose all the threes. Whatever combination of Mayhem Devil, uh, the Midnight Reaper, Woebringer, it's not a trivial thing. It's just that Luris is so busted because it's like Luris is like comparable to all of those cards. It's like a stronger card than Mayhem Devil, but that's if you put in your deck. If you get it without having to put in your deck where you can count on it, and you don't have to use a card on it, that's, that is worth making some enormous sacrifices for. 
Yeah, and I think if you play Luris not as a three, like if you play it as like a four or a five, and you have like the opportunity, like even if you just did like a Rick's Mati Reveler for a discard or something, and then you're like Luris and then immediately get a rebuy, I think that you I think that you're just you're just in a better spot than other cards are affording you, right? Even if some of them have have some different levels of staying power. I mean Luris if they don't kill it, Luris has better staying power than Mayhem Devil anyway. Or by far, like it's just an actual extra card instead of a point of damage. With selection, it's not just a card; it's the best of all the cards in your graveyard. So, can we take a sec. Can we jump over to the 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 standard challenge from four eighteen? God of Slaughter's third place deck, which is also a Rakdos sacrifice deck, which is like a radically different build. Even though it has Luris, it actually just has main deck Luris, right? And this one's going for Obosh in the in the sideboard as the companion instead. Tell me, what do you think about this version versus the other one? Obviously, the the casting costs are in some ways far less restrictive, right? We've got Woe's Rider. We've got, you got one. There's only there's only the only sacrifice really is that so the big one is you don't get to play Priest of the Forgotten Gods. Yep. And then the other notable one is Croxa. But no, but all the sick twos, right? Like the other version we were looking at a second ago, I, I don't know, maybe it just kind of has to play those cards because it's restricted in, in the height of the casting cost. But like, yeah, I, I do think that, you know, there's something to be said for having, you know, eight hasty guys that are building advantages while smashing your face on turn two. Yeah, but at the end of the day... Uh, Judith, Mayhem Devil, Midnight Reaper, Woe Strider. I mean, you'd rather play Woe Strider in your Cauldron Familiar Witches Oven deck, you know? And uh, y- you are making trade offs here. I think Luris is a fair bit better than Obosh, but I do think that if everything else was, if I got to play with Luris, uh, although I don't know, it's kind of nice to be able to play Luris when your deck's all ones and twos anyway. Yeah. The thing I really would do different with uh, this particular Obosh deck is that I don't think it has enough ones. And I realize it's got a lot of ones. <laughs> you know, four Cauldron Familiar, three Gutter Bones, four Serrated Scorpion, four, wo- uh, I'm sorry, uh, four Witches Ovens. That's 15 cards you can play on turn one, 11 of which get the beats going. Right? But uh, there's several things missing. The first four are Whisper Squad. I think there's no way you don't play Whispers. Like you got to play Whisper Squad. You don't need twos. It's so great to be able to activate Whisper Squad as your two. Yeah. Um, also, if you just play with 20-something one-drops, then you can go one drop on turn one, two more one-drops on turn two, and then play a three. So uh, the thing that I would say about this is not even that it doesn't have enough ones, like you were saying – it's only got one more land than the other version. The deck has a lot of threes, right? Like, a, like a huge number of threes. It's got yeah two Judith, I, two Luris, four Mayhem Devil, four Midnight Reaper, and, and you don't even have the mana from Priest, Rider? and you don't have the mana yeah, from like, Priest. But that said, I think a deck that has God Eternal Bantu that knows it has an eighth card that costs five that's really powerful. It's like hard to put yourself in the position of both only having 24 land, but also uh, playing, what is this, 17, what is it, 4, 8, 12, 17. It's 17 three drops. I, I don't hate only playing 24. I could imagine playing 23. I just think that in order to make that make sense, you've got to play a lot more one drops instead of these three drops. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, dude. Uh, what do you think of Drill Bit? I like it here. Yeah, I've never loved Drill Bit. Neither have I. I still don't love it. It's like barely okay. I just think that, (laughs) I think that, I think it's pretty smart in this deck, in this metagame right now, to play Drill Bit instead of Duress in this spot. Obviously, uh, you can't play twos because I actually uh, kind of like agonizing remorse now. I didn't like it before. You remember, I don't like it that much as a card in general. 
But I think that it's kind of important right now against like people you want to have duress against. You want to be able to hit Uro. You want to be able to hit Dream Trawler. You know, and it's uh, I I think that uh, Drill Bit right now being so much more open than duress. It's uh, it's an important part of the equation. So you know what I like about this Obosh deck, even though I kind of hate the the number the threes. threes. Man, Judith and Obosh on the battlefield at the same time. I feel like the game is going to end rapidly. Like that's the... dude. Come if on, you want to combo, so there's not the combo isn't here. But if you wanted, dude, you want a Mondo combo? Put Call with Judith. I mean, uh, actually, it's not even the call. It's the other one that does it. It doesn't matter. You still get an extra a lot of life, but you got to get you got to use the 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 death touch in order to uh, to really get Judith going. But I mean, I don't know. To me, I think you could put them together. I mean, what do you think? Like if you use uh, call, and you could give menace to whichever of these creatures you want. But if you use call and yeah, you only get back one creature instead of two. But Judith is just incredible with Death Touch, right? Oh, yeah. Because then she's just killing whatever you want. Every time you sack something. It's really weird that that's a function of Judith when somebody else is doing the work. But, yeah. That seems good to me. Could be. I mean, I'll tell you what. I don't know if it's, like, good as a central plan. But I'm pretty sure no. that if it was something that I could do sometimes, I would love to take that option sometimes. Oh, yeah. I think it's a minority. It's got to be kind of a niche move, but it's it's a nice one. It's yeah, a nice one I, to have access to in the two, you know, the two to ten percent where it matters. Yeah, I think that there was also a time when people were like. Hey, you know what's a card that we play sometimes? Basilisk Caller. Hey, you know what's a card that we play sometimes? Whatever pinger happens to be legal, right? You know? Like, weird. Sometimes you put Basilisk Caller on the pinger. And then at some point in your life, you're just like, all right, guys. Good thing we have Basilisk Caller. We can go get it with our Stoneforge Mystic to put on our pinger, right? Like, Mm -hmm. it might be one of those things where just like, you know, one day, Tom Ross and LSV were sitting around. They're like, Ugh, I guess we have, you know, there's there's goblins to shoot sometimes. Yeah, let's just Dude, put a pinger. What if, what if there's some kind of a deck that ends, like a, a version of this plays that uh, the new uh, Golgari, Golgari uh, kind of birthing pod Lurgoif thing, Fiend Artisan? Because yeah. remember, Fiend Artisan looks like it's a card for Golgari decks, but you can cast it with just black, black. Yeah, I think that that's and, one of the things that all the companions are get, being a little deceptive on right now, right? So the big fat Simic one is is being played in a deck without green largely right now. And a fiend artisan being able to sacrifice a cauldron familiar and go get another cauldron familiar, or to sacrifice a whisper squad and go get the one off Judith. So that your uh, combo can come together in the right matchup, like so much Stoneforge Mystic for Basilisk Cowler. Not, not only is it not that restrictive, it costs two, so it's even. It costs two, so Lurus can play with it. It has an activated ability, so Zerda can play with it. It's a creature, so in your all-creature deck, Umari can play with it. It's a nightmare, so Kahira can play with it. Uh you know, you could even put it in an 80 card deck and it helps smooth things out so Yorion <laughs> could play with it. It's a uh, it's a Swiss Army knife among companion cards. But uh, I so anyway, I think it, it could be really cool to pull out that move, but there are a couple other companions that could be used in the uh the Rakdos style deck, right? I think Luris is my current top pick, but if you're going to play um if you're going to play uh Jigana, Jagantha. Uh, the nice thing about Jagantha is that you don't have to make any sacrifices. Not really. I mean, you sort of do, but not really. Like you can still play pre. You can play all the one drops. You can play priest. You can play Croxa. You can play. You can play any of these things you want. Like you're so 
barely limited it at all. A lot of these decks don't play anything that would violate it. The downside is that it doesn't really do anything for you. It's just a big dumb idiot. Well, it's also you know, five. Well, I mean, compared to Obosh, right? Yeah, but I mean, I feel like you play Obosh and then just swing with everything and the game ends, right? Like Obosh, Obosh is a lot stronger of an effect on the game. On that turn. Right. Yep. So Gigantha, I think, is is seeing play right now in like green white creature decks, right? Decks that actually appreciate having some sort of mana engine and also appreciate having a random five five. You know, like I think that the Rakdos Sacrifice deck is just like a five five. That's way that's that's way too good for us. We win games with one twos and one ones. Get in there, right? So like. Uh, I think that Gigantha is, I mean, I think you're right. Like there's just nothing that you got to do, uh, that is, is difficult. I mean, you could even play like the Dreadhorde Butcher version or the Croxa version. Those cards don't violate Gigantha's rules. Uh, and you know, you can buy back Croxa kind of, uh, with Gigantha, but, uh, I just don't think it's, it's just not exciting in the same way that Obosh is in that strategy. Yeah. 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 I just, I think it comes down to. How much do you care about stuff like Croxa and Priest of the Forgotten Gods? I think the, I would like the Luris version because Croxa is – I'm in for Croxa. That's the thing. So the Obosh version, we're not, we're not, we're not buddies on that one. Yeah, but he, okay. Then if you play the Luris version, uh, then you're giving up the threes. And so then compared to Gigantha, the question is – do you care about the priests of the Forgotten Gods and the Mayhem Devils and the uh, the Willbringers? I like Luris better than all those, but uh, you know, or, or just being able to play a lot of Luruses. What if you just played Umori and you just didn't play any ovens? Is that so crazy? if you, yeah, well, you also don't get the claim either. I think you, then you're playing a different deck. I don't know why you're even playing red anymore if you're just going to play Umari. Okay, I buy it. Which is fine. I like, I don't know that it's out of the question. There's actually I. I think Umari is uh, being really underrated by people. Um, I think that's only- just because it's only the first week. <laughs> like, how many how many new strategies can there be? I guess ten. <laughs> I like, guess uh, ten. it hasn't shown up yet, but I think that uh, that we're going to see a powerful new tier one blue black flash deck. Uh, there was it- already a blue black flash deck that cracked one of these events. Oh, 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 I missed that one. Is yeah. that just like the most recent one? I gotta find it. Give me a second. Yeah, dude, because dude, blue. I think blue black flash is the truth now, man. Um, yeah, because like we it did is, see uh, Mo- Mono Blue put up eighth place in the standard challenge on four eighteen. <sighs> this is a deck right. I would play. It's I I I mean, this is a strategy I would play. I don't know if I want to play this deck, but. Oh, it's, you you mean fairies? Uh, yeah. So it, it's I think it's got some edges that need to be sanded off. But uh, the butter merchant eighth place on the standard challenge from four eighteen. Yep. Three brazen borrower, four brineborn cutthroat, a dirge bat. Your buddy, the dirge bat that we we had some some uh, not sure about. Three C dash or octopus. I don't know how you play three C dash or octopus and one dirge bat. Maybe that's an availability thing because uh, so early. Then four slither wisp, which is a powerful flash card. Uh, I love slither wisp. I'm a big buyer of slither wisp. So this card is intense. Slither wisp is uh, blue black black for a three two flash. Whenever you cast another spell that has flash. You draw a card and each opponent loses one life. This card is unreal in this deck. Like, it's so insane. Like, if they don't do oh, yeah. with your Slither Wisp, like, you could just, like, play Slither Wisp, have, a, have, like, protection for it. Probably an Aether Gust is good enough, given how standard looks right now. Get in for three and then, like, say go. And then no matter what they do, you just, like, draw three cards the next turn. It's, it seems insane to me. Uh, Spectral Sailor, and then one Voracious Gear Shark. Or Great Shark, sorry. So, uh, I do like the Great Shark. Um, I, I like it even better with a different supporting cast a little bit, though, because, at, <sighs> dude, four Quench, four Neutralize, one Mystical Dispute. Why do you want all these medium counterspells and one Mystical Dispute? You just want... 
Do you just want uh, offense and bounce? Is that what you're going for? Okay, so first of all, I want a fourth brace and borrower. Let's be serious. Well, same. Also, how are there two Omen of the Sea and no, I guess... It has Flash. Just Flash? Yeah, but I would cut them. No Opt? Nope. Uh, Well, I'm not playing Opt either because I want to play Umari. Like, I think that you've got to play with a, a companion in a deck like this. And I don't know what which other companion are you wanting to play. Uh, what about uh, the one two fairy that when you draw two cards he gets a plus one plus one? I I think that's a key missing card. Really? Okay, maybe. I I don't know. I, I haven't tried that one yet. I could imagine it, but I was thinking. Uh, I, I've played first... a lot of that card and Brineborn Cutthroat in various standard decks, and I think the fairy tends to outperform the Cutthroat for two reasons. One, it actually has text against red aggro in the early turns of the game. If you don't play Brineborn Cutthroat, it just trades, right? Like, see, I, if you play I, that I, guy, I, you can eat a one, uh, one toughness. See, I want to play 12 twos. You just play more? Yeah, because once you cut Quench and Heartless Act and Aether Gust, you got to make room for all. I mean, that's, that's eight and then two Omen of the Seas. If you're cutting 10 two drops, you're going to need to add a lot of two drops. And the two drop, I want to keep the Cutthroat. I don't think it's the best two yeah, or anything cutthroat's wanna, good i'm just saying the fairy's better see i want to play that uh the the demir demir two two flash uh cunning night bonder it's uh two two flash and spells with flash you cast cost one less and can't be countered uh so i think that if now at first you're like wait a minute that doesn't make the you know like that doesn't make slither with any cheaper and it doesn't help with spectral sailor why even bother, right? But now here's here's what I'm saying. If you play with four copies of uh, the other shark, like the shark dude, tornado, pouncing shore shark. So pouncing shore shark is really good, right? Like it's a four three flash for five, which is not a good deal, <laughs> but. Mutate three in a blue. Whenever this creature mutates, you may return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. So, like, let's say that your opponent has a Teferi. You can just surprise upgrade your 1-1. One, one. I, I, you don't surprise, like, Flash. You just, on your turn, you go, yeah, yeah. guess what? My guy has virtual haste. Here comes holy Make- strength. Got it. But you also just have this engine that lets you... Uh, continue to to put creatures back into your opponent's hand because if you're playing with a bunch if you have like four pounds in shore sharks and four octopus and then like uh you can and maybe one dirge bat you can actually really stack on top of those braids and borrowers for a lot of uh keeping people off uh creatures on the table and forcing them to play multiple voracious great sharks so patrick not for nothing but the butter merchant did play multiple cunning night bonder in their sideboard although it seems an odd sideboard card no it's well it's against counter spells yeah it's does this deck yeah. strike you as the kind of deck that's scared of counter spells no but i think sometimes you just want to get your your deck closer to the way it should have been before you uh played in the like, tournament. i feel like you're right that we should play that card in this strategy but i think that it's not in the right stack <laughs> Uh, so I think this deck looks uh, pretty sweet. Uh, I'm kind of into trying it with uh, no spells, but I do think that you can play the spell version too. I just think you got to do better than quench and neutralize. I think this deck is definitely promising. Uh, I think like it has a lot of work that needs to be put in. I don't dislike Omen of the Sea at all. I'm just like not a fan of two Omen of the Sea zero opt. This makes z- no sense to me in a deck that has Brineborn Cutthroat. Well, unless you play Umari. Right. But they, they're not. Right. See, I don't think... I think you got to start by getting yourself a companion in a deck like this and then go from there. Well, doesn't have to be Umari. Be somebody else. Pick somebody else. But, but if you're going to go that companion, which is not a bad companion at all, I mean, I think that you gotta, you want to go more Dirge Bats. I'm into Dirge Bat now, if that's if that's the, the new sure. condition on our deck. Um, thing I would note about this deck, uh, I'm actually surprised with one Voracious Great Shark in the main deck that there's not like three more in the sideboard. 
This is exactly the kind of deck that if it presents with four voracious great shark will just murder some decks. Like they'll never win. They just can't beat five, four flash for five that counters their best guy. I think that you could just overwhelm certain types of opponents would love to have seen more voracious great shards in the sideboard. No way I'm playing a ton in the main deck. It's too expensive. See, I, I could play a couple in the main deck. I, I could see playing one. Maybe no, I don't know, man. Dude, I think I once once you have the uh, four copies of the uh, the Night Bonder. Remember, the Night Bonder does make your Great Shark cost less. I mean, that's very very good. Good pointing out on that one. One of the things that I think about the Great Shark that is probably in support of what you were saying a second ago is just that if a lot of other people are playing companions, they just have like a natural extra card, right? They have essentially an eighth card in their opening hand that's always a creature. Great Shark generates, you know, fundamentally generates card advantage against people who are playing with any creature. So as long as their creature can't be, uh, can, can be countered, then the Great Shark actually can neutralize their companion, which I think might be good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's... A great way to put it too is the uh, knowing that they have that companion, it changes the value of a card like the the great shark. Uh, man, so uh, outside of all these uh, these flash decks and uh, sacrifice decks, um, did you see the uh, the any of these blue red real the everwise decks? Uh. So like uh, seventh place, uh, yeah. So I'm a uh, a manatees in seventh place had a build with uh, three copies of real the everwise and four sprite dragons, and so this is like the up to, you know the old like crackling Drake style of blue red. Yeah, that's this deck. Yeah, it's it's got arc light phoenix. I mean, it's funny that you say that because isn't crackling Drake still legal in standard, which is not here. <laughs> Well, it's not powerful enough. Yeah, the things have kind of changed. Uh, this deck actually has access to some different kinds of tools than previous. Um, you know, like stuff like Thrill of Possibility and Cathartic Reunion Shock, Discovery Dispersal, all that. It's like, okay, it's one cantrip or it's another. That's not changing the game. Blitz of the Thunder Raptor, however, this is one in a red instant. And it uh, Blitz of the Thunder Raptor deals damage to target creature or planeswalker equal to the total number of instants and sorcery cards in your graveyard. If that creature or planeswalker would die this turn, exile it instead. Not good on turn two. Very, very good. Not on turn two. Yeah, it doesn't. Well, that's this. That's, you know, true of Hero's downfall, right? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, like, it's this also- is the. It's also great, I think, like on turn four, if you go like uh, Thrill or Cathartic Reunion, discarding potentially multiple cards that um, that would, you know, putting multiple cards into your graveyard, I should say, that uh, that could uh, set up Blitz of the Thunder Raptor and then getting, you know, three plus damage out of it that turn. Yeah, I mean, this this is like a two cost hero's downfall for the most part in this deck, right? Yeah, um, I like... Having like Thrill of Possibility and Cathartic Reunion and Royal Science to get rid of cards like Lava Coil that are very good in some matchups and terrible in other matchups. Totally. Uh, dude, how much do you like Sprite Dragon? The beatdowns? I'm in love with Sprite Dragon. I think this card is going to be great in modern. Oh, yeah. Oh, isn't this, isn't this a legacy card? Uh, probably. Right. So uh, I think that at this point, there are at least three different modern legal cards at blue and a red at two that kind of all would work nicely together uh, <laughs> in terms of like flying, haste, damage output, kind of put them all together. Some of them probably are, are friendly in terms of their ability to, to keep it going while, you know, putting damage forward. Dude, isn't this card just like pretty amazing with like moxes <laughs> yes i mean you know what's good with moxes patrick cards you can cast using mana <laughs> dude so real the everwise is one blue red for a zero three but it's a deceptive zero three 
Uh, Real has plus one uh, power for each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard. So you get a little bit of that Drake action, but instead of flying, you've got when you ever you discard one or more cards for the first time each turn, draw that many cards. So you get them coming with a cathartic reunion, and you get them going a thrill of possibility. That's uh, that's pretty cool. You just do it on each player's turn. Uh, you know, what's... Uh, well, plus the Royal Scions. Oh, of course. What's insane about this deck is like. I think that there are, have been versions of cards like Riel and Sprite Dragon that only get the offensive boost on, you know, just for the turn when people are happy to play them, you know, kind of Wee Dragon out style cards. But both of these cards from the new set keep their power. Like, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. That's a lot for not a lot. <laughs> yeah, you got to kind of kill these things. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you're in trouble. Uh, this deck does not currently have a companion. Yeah. It's weird it has Bone Crusher Giant and Brineborn Cutthroat in the sideboard. The incumbent blue red deck just leaned on an eight pack of those cards in the main. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you got to switch it on them, go back. What do you think about all these decks that are sideboarding three and four copies of Mystical Dispute? Isn't that weird? No. No, I think that's good. Yeah, it, yeah. So uh, I used to main deck Mystical Dispute a little bit more often, but I think right now there's just enough of these sacrifice decks that it's a little bit hard to do that. But it's still a great sideboard because I think that it's really awesome to be able to make uh, multiple big plays early on. Being able to protect yourself against a Teferi is nice, but also just being able to put down a Sprite Dragon and uh, counter a spell in the same turn sequence. You know, particularly a deck like this that wants to spend most of its mana just drawing more, you know, cycling through its its uh, cards. Being able to to just keep open one and still protect yourself is super big. Oh, protecting a Sprite Dragon uh, with, a, with a Mystical Dispute when the opponent does uh, remove a card in their own turn. That's pretty good. To keep yeah, or, plus one. Yeah. Yeah, like even just on your own turn. Like being able to uh, uh, being able to play Dora and attack immediately, and uh, them not be able to uh, heartless act it for fear that you'll play an opt in response and put a counter on it, fizzling the heartless act. Um, and then if they wait on their turn and tap out to play something, obviously you get them with the dispute. Yep. Uh, this is an exciting strategy. Uh, it is not nearly as exciting as the strategy that gave us a couple of uh, copies over the course of some of these events, but is currently banned uh, due to a bug. But I think it's an extremely important deck that we have to talk about just, just because... Yeah, the Garuda deck? Yeah, it, it's going to be a very key player in Standard. What, there was one of them in the top 16 of this event, right? Uh, I think I think there's there's multiple that like showed up. I, I think yeah, Elad three one two seven came in twelfth in this event with one, uh, and I think it's pretty pretty illustrative. Yep. So this deck's got three Garuda Doom of Depths in the main deck, and then one in the sideboard. And the way this deck works is so Garuda costs six and has the condition you have to play evens, right? So it's got Growth Spiral. And, and uh, Paradise Druid to help kind of get there. Other versions and of Humble that, Naturalist too. Uh, Th- that's the new one, the one in a green for a one three that taps for a mana of any color, but can only be used on creatures. So uh, I think that there have been some versions that have the new explosive vegetation also, but not this particular version played by Elad three one two seven. The point is, you get like a, a, a relatively accelerated Garuda. You could play it theoretically on, let's say, turn four. When you play it, you start flipping stuff over, and the thing that you really want to flip over is a Spark Double, right? So a Spark Double is a clone, but if it clones something that's legendary that the clone is not legendary, right? So you can you cheat like, the system. You get yeah. ahead. So but you like, still get the trigger. You still yep. get another Garuda trigger. So you're just like Garuda, spark double, flip again, you, you know, and then you could potentially get a Charming Prince. The sex got Charming Prince. And you don't have to do this very many times before there's a prohibitive amount of power in play on turn four. And remember, if you get a Luminous Broodmoth, 
Uh, Luminous Brood Moth is an even that you can flip and put in play from your Garuda. But you could also just have it in play already so that when you play Garuda and you flip another Garuda and it legend rules, the Garuda, the legend rules will come back as a uh, flyer, but you'll get an extra trigger. And then you can nice. actually – then you actually legend rule the other one, and it'll come back as a flyer. So by playing a Garuda while you have a Luminous Broodmoth, if you ever hit another Garuda or something that can uh, like copy it, you're going to get two extra triggers on top of the extra trigger it gives you. The only saving grace for Standard right this second is – that there's no Dragon Lord Kolagon in standard, right? So <laughs> at least all these guys don't have haste. But I think that the presence of Luminous Broodmoth in this build is so powerful because even if the opponent has some kind of wrath to, to even the board up, the Luminous Broodmoth will, will defend your side of the battlefield. It's very strong. Extremely. So yep. I, th- I think, I mean, this is... If there's going to be a spoiler deck to come out of the new set, this is the one. I mean, hyper consistent because of the ability to play Garuda out of your sideboard as a companion. Three more Garudas in the main deck. Every one of them is generating card advantage. When you're stacking them with cards like Charming Prince and Spark Double and Thassa Deep Dwelling for that for that matter, uh, insane amount of additional triggers. I think your expectation is usually to put your opponent in a position where if they don't deal with your, your side of the battlefield, you just win the game on the next attack. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think the majority of the time that you can play Garuda, you're going to have a game winning attack on the next turn. And the fact that you get Garuda every time kind of makes this a defining deck. Now that said, I think you can build your decks to be good against this, but you have to, just be ready because you know that they're literally going to be able to do this every, the first time they hit six mana. Which is going to be turn four a lot of the time. They're building their deck to have multiple mana accelerators on turn two and three. And so, you know, you got to deal with it or you're going to get dealt with. And I think it, it, it bears mentioning almost every build I've seen has got four copies of Destiny Spinner in the sideboard. So Des- Destiny Spinner is one in a G for a 2-3 creature and enchantment spells you control can't be countered. Yeah, plus it has that three and a green target land ability. You know, target land you control becomes an XX with trample and haste where X is the number of enchantments you control. That part doesn't come up as much. It's uh, not nothing. It probably matters to help win some uh, games. Some chump blockers. But the fact is, in, in this deck, when you're bringing Destiny Spinner in, Usually, I think it's as a as a defense grid to make sure that your Garuda resolves because you are going to try to kill somebody. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so, man, there were a bunch of these Necrosage decks, right? Like Karuga, the Macrosage. Yep. Uh, which part of that is that if you just look at the Fires of Invention Jeskai decks, uh, like we talked about in the show a couple weeks ago, you don't even have to, like, do anything. You literally just take out two Aether Gusts and you're there. <laughs> and uh, for your troubles, you know, like, look at this deck. This deck is literally the same deck, except uh, for its spells, it replaced the two Aether Gusts with two Hakdos, the Unscarred. And then its mana is better because it's got Rogrin Triome. Uh, which build are you looking at? Because, like, there's a bunch. That oh, yeah, there. yeah. Kazan, uh, K- Kazaner 3000. Uh, in that same 418 event. Yep. Um, so uh, 18th or 13th place, 13th place. So Kazaner 3000, uh, when Hakdos, the Unscarred, uh, comes down, yeah, maybe you don't have a Bone Crusher Giant in play or something, so you don't necessarily get the trigger immediately. But if you do... Uh, uh, I guess you can, it's not about, sorry, not the trigger, but uh, when he comes down, the protection isn't necessarily that relevant, but sometimes it is, and 6-1 hits so hard. So, I don't know, man, like, uh, Hakdos the Unscarred is, like, kind of just hits like a truck, right? Oh, yeah, I think that card is underrated, and I was surprised that it didn't see play before. 
Um, maybe we'll see even more copies because it's actually one of the relatively easy cards to drop if you're just like, you know, fourth turn fires of invention and now I have like a relevant thing I can drop uh, immediately on that turn. Because I think a lot of the time you'd rather have that than a Sphinx of Foresight on defense. Um, you know, it's it's hard to kill. Uh, what do you think? What do you think of No Elspeth Conquers Death in the main deck? Uh, I think that I would go a different direction than that. And some people, you know, uh, like I asked, uh, you know, which build because I think some people do have some copies of Elspeth Conquers Death in the main deck. Some people have like Dream Trawlers in the main deck. Um, I, I think that surprisingly, because this deck has got a lot of committed space, right? It's got four Fires of Invention in the main deck, four Teferi, it's got Karuga the Macro Sage in the sideboard. I think there's actually going to be a pretty decent amount of kind of flexibility in deck design. Like For example, the one we're looking at right now, uh, the 13th place deck, has got 30 lands, which is kind of a lot of lands. Well, yeah, a lot of these decks have 30, though. Like, Papado, uh, 90 and 15th place, also had 30. And the 17th place list had 29. Uh, the 18th place list had 29. So, I mean, they're going pretty deep on the, uh, the, uh, the having lots of extra land. I guess the mid-game, if you're playing the Triome, it's like you have a cycling card that you can, you know... Kind For of, free! Yeah. So, uh, just to talk about... Papado 90s 15th place deck just wanted to throw it out there you know here's one of the kind of the flex slots i was intimating towards two copies of narset of the ancient way your preview card showing up here what do you think about that planeswalker Dude, next to teferi uh, i like narset plus it gained i mean it really messes with people who are trying to do stuff like cycling they can try to get around it a little bit by cycling once a turn on your turn right but, like, Narsa has a new context now. So um, the thing that I like about Narsa to the ancient way is just... Oh, 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 the other Narsa. My bad. Yeah. Looking at the wrong list. Yeah, no, that Narsa is kind of cool, too, though. Just the combination of being able to uh, keep your draw going, but also just coming down and immediately having a big board presence. You've got so many expensive cards. Like, it's easy. And you're not going to be able to play all the extra ones from your hand anyway. Yeah, if you've got Narset of the Ancient Way and you don't have Fires of Invention, you can kind of use it to cast one of your, your big fatties the next turn, right? Like, this helps you just pop over to six. Yeah, well, plus it just comes down and immediately can kill something, Yeah. right? Like, give you some tempo. So, um, I mean, obviously, that... Big fatty would have to be like an Elspeth Congress death, not a creature. But uh, I think the, I think that like it's also the mana's fungible, right? So sometimes you can just like have the extra mana to start a Bone Crusher Giant or a Brazen Borrower, and then use the rest of your mana to, to play the other side of it. I think I think it's some smoothing from that perspective. Also, um, I just like its presence because Narset of the Ancient Way got kind of a bad rap early on relative to some of the other Planeswalkers in in Ikoria because this is like. It's kind of an old school feeling planeswalker. Like this looks like a a 2015 planeswalker, less than a 2019 planeswalker. But looks like Narset still got something going on here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm, you know, I I personally I'm big, big, big into that uh, into the new green planeswalker. Um, but I I don't know if I saw any lists with uh, with the new uh, Nivian yet. It's a new Vivian. It's been like three days. There's gonna be there's gonna be awesome stuff with a lot of new cards. You know, I was really surprised uh, just what we've seen so far. I wasn't that surprised at how many companions were like making their way into the metagame and contributing to both new archetypes like Garuda and existing archetypes like. Uh, Karuga or Erluris, but the thing I was surprised about was I just looking at the set. I didn't think it was going to be as influential as like the last two or three sets because I mean we're just coming off of Oko's and we were coming off of yeah, a ton of stuff I, in the last set too. But Luris is going to be to vintage, like you said already. Like Rosewater had to clarify today that. Uh, 
that they can ban cards and vintage if it comes to that. <laughs> like, there are a lot of people concerned because you can't restrict it. It doesn't accomplish anything, you know? I mean, I guess they can make some special rule. You can't play Luris in your sideboard. <laughs> but, like, that's weird. Uh, there, There is another deck, though. Um, God, where is it? The uh, In the 20, the 420 event, uh, played on the 19th, but I think it's listed as 420. Uh, so 35 land. Let me just start you off with that little bad boy there. You know, because... There's only, you know, as you might imagine, this is a Yorion deck. But I was going to say 35 land, but out of how many cards? So this 80 card deck with uh, four fires of invention also has Uro, Fay of Wishes, Arboreal Grazer, Gross Spiral, Elspeth Conquers Death, Omen of the Forge, Omen of the Sea, Shark Typhoon, Narset of the Ancient Way, Narset Parker of Veils, Tamiyo, Collector of Tales, and Teferi. <laughs> along with 35 land. Uh, the biggest hit out of the sideboard, Ruinous Ultimatum, alongside Inspired Ultimatum. That way they don't know which way you're going to go. Well, if you're going to play a Fires of Invention deck, then kind of at some point it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> yep. I mean, this deck also is Uro. Right, arboreal yeah. grazer. This isn't like a lot of decks we've seen in the past. All right, so it 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 has some wackadoo elements. Uh, obviously, it's relying on the fact that when Urion enters the battlefield, exile any number of non-land permanents you own and control. I mean, cards like Uro, Elspeth Conquers Death, any of those omens. Uh, you get to reset your Narset, Parter of Veils, yeah, who had and- ticked down. Get your planeswalkers back up and going. This Get your is, grazer to double up. Yeah. I mean, if you do enough extra card drawing with Uro and Omen of the Sea, you might just have an extra land to put down. Even blinking Omen of the Forge is pretty good. It it is good. I guess it's super good because you can always do it. Because as long as you've got your five mana, you can always cast Urion. Um but I, I I think if you didn't have the auto Urion ability, I would be no for sure. I, I would be a little reluctant on that. They also wouldn't make the first sixty. They are <laughs> part of sixty one through eighty. So here's the thing: I'm gonna have to realign my own thinking because a lot of these cards are representing one card combos now. Like you know, back in the day, we we're like, well, we got to get we got to get our Splinter Twin and our Pester Might or whatever. Well, well if you always start with a Pester Might. All you have to do now is find the Splinter Twin. Your life gets a lot easier. So there's a secret combo with Yurion in this deck, and that's Fires of Invention. <gasps> you see, you can play... Yeah, so what you do is when you have all your mana, yep. you play a spell that uh, for no mana that costs however much land you have, but you don't have to tap anything. Then you, uh, you actually... Remember, you can actually play uh, Yorion using your mana, exile Fires of Invention, and then just keep spending your mana on whatever you want. Uh, Actually, you don't even have to. As long as Yorion is one of your first two cards, you can just cast uh, Yorion for free also, so you still have all your mana available to you. Well, when you Yorion, your Fires isn't going to come back till the end of the turn. So you actually just have the turn to spend your mana however you want, cheating the one, you know, the two per turn limit. Yeah. Crazy. I like breaking the rules that way. That's that's sick. Well, awesome, dude. I feel like we're only beginning to scratch the surface. Obviously, uh, companions are really shaking things up. Uh, it's a, I. I I have never been in the position before. I was just like, it's never going to be the same again. But right now, unless they do something to change it back to the way it was, it seems like it's never going to be the same again. Ah, uh, dude, evolution. All right. All right. I'll see you next week. Change your die. See you next week. Dredges for jailer hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis.